For nearly 40 years, Sam Little reigned terror across more than a dozen states. Between 1970 and 2005, all while hiding in plain sight and preying on the most vulnerable members of society, women who he sketched and kept drawings of as souvenirs and memorabilia. Samuel Little is the deadliest most prolific serial killer in U.S. history. This is his story. Little Rock. Tell me what that girl looked like. Oh man, I loved her. I forget her name. Oh wait, I think it was Ruth. The heavy set, big old yellow gal. She was like a uh, honey color skin. She weighed about close to, to 200, about 170. I parked the car facing out where I could see anybody coming in. So I, I pulled her out of the car. She's too big for me to carry, carry her, so I just pulled out the car and laid on that trash that was lit there. Sam Little was requested by a lot of you guys, so I cannot shout out just one particular person because a million people literally asked me to do this video. Shout out to all of y'all. He was born June 7, 1940. He was a Gemini, so um, Gemini's. These are your people. And he was also born in Reynolds, Georgia, so. If he's from your hometown, then these are your people too, okay? This moisturizer it feels so good. Now, according to little Sam, his mother was a teenage prostitute and she abandoned him and ran off and left him with his grandmother to be raised. But um, it is widely speculated that his mother actually gave birth to him while she was in prison. And so she had no choice but to give him to his grandmother. Cause you know, they don't let you keep your kids in jail. Whatever the case, he was born in Reynolds, Georgia, and shortly thereafter, he was sent to live with his grandmother in Lorraine, Ohio. He reportedly had a very difficult time in high school, and he dropped out, decided, you know what, this ain't for me, I'm out. Now, in his teen years, he began committing little crimes, starting with theft, little petty theft here and there. As a result of that, he was sent to a juvenile detention center where it just pretty much, instead of rehabilitating him, trying to get him on the right track, offering him some mentorship it just made him worse i guess he went there and just picked up some new new criminal tips because homeboy just he just became worse after leaving juvenile he began moving state to state committing random crimes more theft fraud you know like i said he had apparently acquired some skills down to the detention center from the other little bad children he got himself a couple duis a couple of assault charges Homeboy was just out here. Armed robbery, you know, just to name a few. In his late 20s, he reconnected with his mother. She at the time had moved to Florida and so he decided he was gonna go down there and join her and that's what he does. He got him a little job. At one point he worked at a cemetery. At another point he was an ambulance attendant. It's like, that's kind of random, but okay. Now in 1961, when he was just 21 years old, he was arrested for armed robbery, breaking into a furniture store and robbing them. He was sentenced to three years in Ohio at Mansfield and there he picked up him a couple more skills. Cause one thing about Sam, when he get locked up, he gonna learn something new. But here he took up boxing, which unfortunately, in instead of him getting out and like pursuing a boxing career, he used those techniques to well, we'll get there. Now, Sam, living in Florida with his mother and his newfound interest and skill of boxing paired with his very odd strangulation fetish, which according to him, went all the way back to his childhood. According to him, he achieved his first erection while watching his kindergarten teacher touch her neck. He also stated that as a teenager, he would take photos of women who were victims of strangulation and post them on his bedroom wall. And that was like his, his Lil' Kim poster. You know what I'm saying? Like everybody else had the Lil' Kim, Lil Kim poster where I squatting down and homeboy had a lady who had been strangled. Now the year is 1970. He's still in Miami with his mother and he decides, you know what? I'm going down to the bar goes to the bar and he meets a lady by the name of Mary Brosley. It's New Year's Eve, he's feeling himself, and he's feeling Mary too. And unfortunately, she's feeling him. She don't know he's a weirdo. So the two spend most of their night together at the bar, and then they decide that they were going to leave the bar, go somewhere where they could have a little bit more privacy. Now in the early, early hours of the morning on 1971, New Year's Day, 
they leave the bar together and they decide to drive and they drive down to a deserted stretch of the road near the florida everglades and decide you know this is the perfect spot for us to just be alone at least that's what mary's thinking but sam has Sam has other plans in mind. Now that night, Sam commits his first murder by strangling Mary and burying her in a shallow grave near that little stretch of the road where they pulled over. After he abandons her, he just pretty much waits to see if anything happens. And when she is not found, he gets this sense of confidence that he could do these kind of things and not be caught. And so he literally spends the next three years of his life committing similar crimes throughout the Miami area, specifically targeting African-American women, mostly sex workers and trans women whom he felt wouldn't be missed and weren't important members of society, which is which is not fucking true. But shout out to infamous Yaya T on Instagram. I posted a picture from my last video. She was like, can we get a black smoky? And I'm like, girl. That's actually what I'm filming tomorrow, which is today. Anyway, back to the story. So after spending three years terrorizing the streets of Miami, Florida, he decides to take himself back to Cleveland, Ohio. Of course, he was still up to his old tricks of robbery and assault, honey, because not long after he was arrested for armed robbery and sodomy. He was actually acquitted of the robbery charges and then the sodomy charges were not pursued and so he pretty much walked away without doing any time for this crime. Bars. Y'all ain't heard bars that I mean it. Very soon after this, he enters a relationship with a woman by the name of Aurelia Jean Dorsey, who was 30 years older than him. Get him an old cougar. Now, Miss Dorsey was a little old shoplifting expert, honey. They got together and she told him look this is how you do it she taught him not only how to steal and get away with it but how and where to deal all his stolen goods just a little old match made in hell child sam and dorsey moved around the midwest and the south throughout the late 70s making a living for themselves by stealing dealing and doing other odd jobs during the day they would go out and they would do all their little shady business and at night when dorsey went to sleep According to Sam, he would go out and hunt for victims on his own and she had no clue that this was going on. Now, we don't know if he was trying to protect her or what, but this is what he claimed. In September of 1976, Sam is arrested for kidnapping and sexually assaulting a woman outside of St. Louis, Missouri. According to his victim, Sam choked and strangled her before sexually assaulting her inside of his car. Now for this crime, he was convicted and sentenced to only three months in county jail. Like what? How? This of course did not slow him down at all. As soon as he got out of jail, he hit the ground running. From prison, the two decide that they want to move down to the Gulf, and so that's what they do, but he had a string of victims along the way, and so that really makes me feel like, Miss mm, Dorsey, Miss Girl, you knew what was going on. Like, how, how would you not know? He assaulted two sex workers in Pascagoula, Mississippi, both managing to survive the attack. During his stay in Pascagoula, he was also arrested for shoplifting because, you know, he likes to steal, and that's how him and Miss Dorsey were making their money stealing and dealing during this time a lady by the name of melinda rose laprie was found murdered and she was last seen getting into a car with a guy who was described to look exactly like sam little there were plenty of witnesses who saw her getting into his car who were able to identify him as the man who they saw her last with and he was brought up on charges however a grand jury declined to indict him ridiculous meanwhile plenty other women mostly sex workers were coming up dead all over pascagoula police were unsuccessful in solving these crimes a lot of them were unsolved sam was brought in as a suspect on a few of these killings but for some strange reason, he was never convicted. They were quick to haul his ass off to jail for stealing, but not for killing. I don't understand. Meanwhile, one of his theft arrests resulted in him being extradited back to face charges for the rape and murder of Patricia Mount in Gainesville, Florida. Again, he was the last person seen with the victim leaving the bar and the next morning her naked and bruised body was found in a field. Once again, he's acquitted of all charges. Like how are you, 
How you evading this, sir? Now, his trial did little to subdue his thirst for violence and just being a terrible person all around. He's constantly getting away with it. He's feeling like he's untouchable and like he'll never go to jail for anything. He won't ever suffer consequences. So I guess why not? By late 1984, Sam had moved to Southern California. He was arrested for assaulting two women in San Diego. He was tried for attempted murder and he pled guilty to assault and false imprisonment. For this, he served only two and a half years in prison. Just two and a half. Now, with this conviction, he had to submit a DNA sample that would just be forever on file with the FBI. After his release in 1987, he relocates to LA the mean streets of Los Angeles. Now he was attracted to LA for a reason. At the time, the late 80s, the crack epidemic was a really big thing at the time. There was a lot of gang violence going on and LA had pretty much become a hunting ground for serial killers at the time. A lot of them were active in this area during this time. They were mostly preying on women in high crime areas. A year after relocating to LA, the love of his life, dealing as Miss Dorsey, she passes away suddenly from a brain hemorrhage and he didn't take it well because she had been his partner in crime for all of these years and um, she had taught him a lot. This really caused him to spiral. He spent the next 10 years in LA using these areas, these high crime areas as a hunting ground for women whom he looked at as disposable members of society. Um, my good sir, that would be you actually. One sad reality and reason why he was able to commit so many crimes in one area without them going noticed or him being caught is the fact that, like I said, he preyed on sex workers, drug addicts, many of which being women of color. And so you know how that goes. They weren't really bothered about finding the perpetrator for these women. In an interview that he did later, he stated, quote, I ain't never killed no senators or governors or fancy New York journalists. Nothing like that. I stayed in the ghettos. As if that justifies anything or makes it okay. Self-hate is real and rampant, child. It's very obvious that homeboy has some mommy issues. You know, he said his mother was a prostitute and she abandoned him. And so he probably just feeling a way about that. All of these women were probably just a stand-in for his mother, you know. They probably represent his mama. Damn, ridiculous. Eventually, he gets tired of LA and he decides he wants to travel back to Ohio. And he does, but not without killing along the way. Now, he claims that his final victim was a woman that he killed in Tupelo, Mississippi. She was a woman by the name of Nancy Stevens, whose body was found strangled and left on the side of the road in August of 2005. Of course, this was yet another case that went unsolved. Two years after this, he goes back to LA, where he is arrested for possession of cocaine. Now, for his drug charges, he pled guilty, and then from there, he was ordered to attend rehab. It was a court order. He never showed up, and so a bench warrant was issued for his arrest. During this time, he was actually receiving Social Security, and so tracking his Social Security payment, the detectives were able to locate Sam at a homeless shelter in Louisville, Kentucky. Now, by this time, he is old. He's 72 years old, but uh, the U.S. Marshals, they didn't give a shit about that because they busted in, raided the homeless shelter, gathered that girl up, and extradited him back to California. Now, while in custody, remember I told you back in the day they took that sample and it was entered into the National FBI database? Well, they realized that his DNA was a match for a woman who had been murdered by the name of Carol Alfred back in 1987. It was also discovered that his DNA was a match for two more unsolved homicides. The 1989 murders of Audrey Nelson and Guadalupe Apodaca. I believe I said that right. I hope I said that right. Y'all know I ain't trying to disrespect nobody by mispronouncing their name. Now, the serial killers I don't too much give a fuck about, but the victims I do, so... There's that. He was indicted on three counts of murder with special circumstances in April of 2013. The jury found him guilty on all counts and he was sentenced to serve three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole ever. Now, despite his conviction, he maintained his innocence until 2018. In 2018, he agreed to be interviewed by Texas Ranger James Holland. And once he started to tell his story, honey, he did not stop. He spent the next year 
and a half, confessing to over 93 murders during 650 hours worth of interview tapes. More disturbing than anything, authorities were able to confirm those killings thanks to these drawings, drawings of the victims drawn by Sam himself from memory. Like he sat up here and spent his time in his little cell drawing out these women as he remembered them. And the child has seen the drawings. They claim that the drawings were so good that they were able to identify the women Maybe so, but the drawings ain't even all that. So I ain't gonna give him all of that like he's some great artist. Here, here are the drawings. You, you judge them yourself and form your own opinion. Regardless of how crappy I think the drawings are myself, my own personal opinion, they were able to help authorities reopen and close dozens of Jane Doe cases that otherwise were not able or would never have been solved. He was also able to give names and dates for these women. That's kind of creepy and weird if you ask me, but... Whatever gets the case to solve and close, eh? He also gave very, very detailed accounts of the crimes. He remembered all of the details down to like how the women smelled, little details about the jewelry they wore, the style of their hair, like the car that they drove, where he had met them and picked them up from, where he'd left them. Almost a hundred women, all of these details. Like, baby, I can barely remember details about myself from yesterday. So this is just this was just mind-boggling to me one of the women whom he opened up about killing was a woman by the name of denise brothers her murder had taken place in 1994 that was within the statute of limitations so they hit that ass with another charge he pled guilty but by cooperating with the prosecutors he was able to avoid the death penalty and so he just received yet another life sentence you know one thing about these murderers honey they be so scared of the death penalty but Look at what you out here doing to people like you deserve it most of all. I don't get it. Be out here killing folks but scared to die. He also pled guilty to four more Ohio murders. Anna Seward in 1981, Mary Jo Payton in 1984, Rose Evans in 1991, and a Jane Doe whose body is yet to be discovered but he admitted to it and they hit that ass again. Why not? Now, as a result of that, he was hit with an additional four life sentences. Currently, Sam Little is 79 years old. He's still alive, but he is in poor health and he's currently incarcerated down to the Los Angeles County State Prison. Now, in all, he confessed to 93 murders, many of which are still pending verification. But even if no other confessions are able to be confirmed, Sam Little is still now the deadliest known killer in U.S. history. That is it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, y'all. This guy was, I don't know, I didn't really, I don't like any of them, but I specifically, like, I especially did not like him and i kept getting requests for this video and i you know i, I want i want to get people what they want but anyway thank you so much for watching i hope you guys enjoyed the video please don't forget we are at 40k and the goal is to get to 100k by the end of the year so um help mama out with that by liking commenting subscribing sharing the video and you know every little bit helps to boost the algorithm even the dislikes from the haters. So we're going to let them live, okay? We're going to let them make it. As always, I appreciate you so much for watching. And I will see you in the next one. Peace.